in spurts that our speakers, who do not get paid and who sometimes have other reasons for not showing up, they ask if they could come again. And they have always agreed to come again. So the speaker, Peter, um, you know Peter? Oh, okay. He was kind enough to say he could come in June. So we're starting our summer program in June, <laughs> June 2nd. <laughs> A little early than usual, but I really wanted him. But of course, I got in replacement. You know, one door closes and another door opens. And Karen Gewertz, who I love and who is a friend of, of the, our library, and our, I just think you're terrific. And um, you first spoke, I just have to tell you, you spoke here October 10th, 2002. Okay. Okay. And wow. you spoke on your, she wrote a book called She Put Mercury in the Morning Milk, Women <laughs> Criminals in the 18th Century. <laughs> Then you came in 2003, you spoke History Mystery, the Fascination with Historical Murder Mysteries. You spoke on Jane Austen and Film and Literature, Isaac Newton Writes a Novel, Science and the Novel. You spoke on American Film Satire. You, you had a program in July, I always like to have something light, and you did Farce and Satire in the Films of Mel Brooks. Which was, was, you could do that again, and I would, be happy I would to love do it again. That. I love that. I loved it. You did one on great American poet musicians, Langston Hughes and Paul Simon. You did Jane Austen in film and literature. You did Funny Women. And you did Pirates and Legend, History and TV. Now, when I asked Karen, who was kind enough after just having a bas mitzvah <laughs> and um, with all of her work that she did, um, she said she'll title it. Best Friends, Robinson Crusoe and Friday in the 21st century. So it's completely different than the brain discussion. But <laughs> sorry. Let me tell you, no, don't be sorry, because we're learning every time that they come and you leave with one bit of information that you didn't have before, you're ahead of the game. And then if you have cookies and coffee, you're <laughs> and then you get all the information from our wonderful friends who are running things here in the library. Um, Tonya, she's doing a phenomenal job as friends of the library, mm -hmm. and Nan, and Peggy, and, and Sandy. Uh, all of you are doing so wonderful. So the town of South Orange is really unique, and um, I'm proud to be part of it, even though I don't live here. <laughs> but I, you know, like I say, I do feel like I'm a part of it, and I, and I, think, I thank you all for being so wonderful, and coming to the programs and going to all the things that that are run here. It makes it special. So now, I always thank all of my fellow friends and librarians for all of their help and support. Believe me, Brent is now filming these these classes, these workshops. So we have it to look at another time if you go on YouTube and then you put South Orange Public Library. So that's available. Shanice sets up and does such a phenomenal job with the chairs, with everything, such a help. So I really appreciate everybody who works here, my friends. And now, let's not waste any more time. I want to hear about best friends, Robinson and Friday. <laughs> Please, let's give a very warm welcome. Uh, so you should know that uh, in the English department at Seton Hall, we share offices. I, so I have an office mate, and I told him where I was coming today, and I said, you've got to get in touch with Phyllis. It's so much fun to come to the library and talk. And he said, really? I'd love to do it. So you may see yet another English person on the roster. I really hope so. he's, he's fabulous. And he's hip and he's young and he's fabulous. So, um, so I'm going to start off. I'm a teacher, so I'm going to start in a very teacherly kind of way. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many people have seen a movie or a television show that began as a book? Uh -huh, right? Okay. So um, what, what was it? Show of hands. Anybody want to say what it was that you saw? Yeah. The Notebook. The Notebook. Great. Fabulous. What else? What else? Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. All right. Any yeah. others? Oh, Big Short. Brooklyn's popular. Mockingbird. Okay. Yeah. Right. To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, oh that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this gives you a sense, right, that it's, it's pretty common. Um, and it's been a part of filmmaking since the very beginning. And it, it goes, actually, adaptations go way, way back in film history. 
But here's this question, why are we doing this? Why are we adapting these books into film and television? And my daughter has a pin that says, never judge a book by its movie. <laughs> Burns Bookstore in Maplewood, by the way, that's where we got. Um, so race is an interesting question, right? The relationship between an original and its adaptation, sometimes that can be a pretty tense relationship. Uh, right? People, people get disappointed. They say, that's not what they look like, and that sort of thing. So why do we do this? What's gained? Well, there's a lot of reasons for this. I'm going to give you a few, but of course, there are far more than a few. Um, sometimes people make an adaptation because of hubris. In other words, they think that the version they make is better than the original. Uh, that's the case, for example, with the film The Scarlet Letter that starred Demi Moore. I don't know if any of you saw that. Um, uh, don't let any 10th grader ever see that if they think they can just replace it in the book. Um, the director, actually, in an interview said that they were telling the story that Hawthorne wanted to tell, but just couldn't tell because he was alive in the 19th century. Okay, so that's why. Sometimes people make an adaptation because they think that telling it in a certain way will bring out some elements that you might not have seen in it before. So Baz Luhrmann's adaptations of La Boheme into Moulin Rouge, for example, or his film adaptation of The Great Gatsby are examples of that point of view. If I tell the story in a certain way, you'll think about it in certain ways. So you'll see things that weren't there before. Sometimes people make an adaptation because they think that the retelling will make it more comprehensible or the word that I really hate, relevant. This is the case, for example, with Romeo and Juliet, because of course, as we know, it's never relevant. Um, that was starring Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio, for example, it was made about 20 years ago. Um, or, for example, the retelling of Jane Austen's Emma as Clueless, which was start, which starred Alicia Silverstone. <clears throat> Sometimes people make an adaptation because the cultural power of the original text allows them to do something. That's the kind of adaptation that I'm going to talk about today. A text that has a certain cachet, a certain power, and you use that to do something. So before I get into the, the nitty gritty of Robinson Crusoe, I want to talk a little bit about process. What happens when you make an adaptation? How does that work? Well, first thing is, right, you create something. You create the adaptation. Um, so now we have Moulin Rouge, now we have Clueless, and so on. But, of course, that's not the only thing that gets created. One thing that gets created is the idea of the original that the audience, and by an extension, the culture, possesses. The quantity and quality of the reputation that Jane Austen's novels enjoyed changed dramatically, for example, in the wake of the... 1995 BBC A&E adaptation that starred Jennifer Eel and a wet linen t-shirt that is Colin Firth. Um, another thing that gets created is when something's adapted is the contemporary idea of the culture in which both texts, the adaptation and the original text, operate. So for example, all those beautiful adaptations of Austen's novels, they spawned a whole film genre called heritage film. And Heritage Film's really beautiful scenery. I mean, if anybody remembers Howard's End with that incredible scene of the purple irises, right? You know, the rest of the movie, forget it. Those purple irises are amazing. Um, so the, anyway, Heritage Film. Um, it create, created in Britain a nostalgia about their past. A, it was a cultural phenomenon and also a sense of nationalism. We are the land of beautiful cliffs and stately houses. Right. Um, so to put it another way, when someone adapts a text from our cultural past, we think of that past differently, and we think of our present differently, as not only influenced by the original text, but also as a different thing that we imagined it before we adapted. So we have an idea of our culture, we have an adaptation, it affects our idea of who we are now because of the way we understand our past to be. It's sort of backwards to go forwards. So adaptations, therefore, whether we want them to or not, shape our perception of our past, and they therefore shape our perception of who we are today. And that's the issue of adaptation that I want to talk about today. I find that fascinating, that we retell a story for the past in order to understand who we are now differently because we changed who we were then. Right. Okay, so anyway, um, the novel that I'm going to talk about and the television uh, adaptation I'm going to talk about is Daniel Defoe's novel, Robinson Crusoe, which was published originally in 1719, so it goes back kind of a long way. Has anybody read the original by any chance? Do I have any original um, Crusoe readers? No. If you haven't read it, by the way, it's, it's actually fabulous. Um, my students are like, oh no, and then they're like, wow, that's fabulous. Um, so a lot happens in that novel, and for the people who have read it, you know, um, that the most famous part is actually only the last third. Um, there's actually, he does all of this other stuff, and then he gets shipwrecked. 
Um, so that famous part where he gets shipwrecked on the island and he lives there for decades and then he's rescued and he's returned to England by an English ship, that's the part everybody remembers. And that's the part that's always the subject of adaptations. Within that part of the novel, one of the most famous episodes is Crusoe's discovery of the bare footprint in the sand. It's so iconic, you don't even have to read the novel to know like a picture of a bare foot on a beach somehow connects to Robinson Crusoe. Um, and that bare footprint, of course, leads eventually to his rescue of Friday, who is a Carib. The Caribs are the tribe of people living around the, uh, the perimeter of the Caribbean. They lived on the islands and also on the, the coast of uh, South and Central America. So um, when Crusoe finds him, Friday is about to be eaten by cannibals, but Crusoe rescues him. And Friday immediately then puts Crusoe's foot on his head to signify that he is Crusoe's servant. Uh, Crusoe's very happy about this. He's happy to have Friday as his servant, and he proceeds to teach Friday English and Christianity, neither of which does Friday profess all that well. So he's either a really bad student or Crusoe is a really bad teacher. You can take it back. Um, so when Crusoe is rescued, Friday goes with him to Europe and then to England. And no one who they encounter seems all that surprised or confused by a white Englishman's roaming around Europe with a black Arab servant. And Friday certainly has his uses, such as fighting off wolves in the Pyrenees, or entertaining Crusoe and his traveling companions when they're stranded in a blizzard. Well, this character of Friday has been really uncomfortable for readers for a long time. The representation of a black person is not flattering or respectful. Friday's comic illiteracy, his antics, his seemingly foolish questions, his incomplete grasp of the fundamentals of Christianity, his embrace of servitude, Crusoe, can be really troubling to 20th and 21st century audiences. Everything in Defoe's depiction, Defoe's depiction of Friday constructs Friday as naturally inferior to Crusoe, and not only that, as embracing this inferiority, right? He's, he's not just happy with it, he's like, yeah, I am inferior. So if we're to take that representation as an emblem of the Anglo-American past, we can't avoid the racism and the slavery on which the British Empire was built, and also on which the American economy was built. These attitudes in a canonical novel, which is fundamental to the definition of classic Anglophone literature, are therefore fundamental attitudes in the history of Anglo-American culture, and also to the present cultural socioeconomic moment. <coughs> so Defoe's Robinson Crusoe tells us what used to be, and in so doing, what we are descended from, and perhaps still possess. So if you see it in that light, the television, of the television adaptation of Robinson Crusoe is really interesting. Now, I, I need to say right at this moment, I do not recommend this show as high art, okay? This is not like The Wire or Breaking Bad. It, don't even think about it. I, but it's a fascinating cultural artifact, so I, I am not celebrating, you know, a poster like a Michelangelo, but as a cultural artifact, it's really, I think it's super cool. Okay, so the questions I'm going to ask and hopefully answer for you are what does this adaptation do to the original and in so doing? What does this adaptation do to our understanding of the past and therefore of the present? So writing about assigning contemporary Robinson ads, and Rob a Robinson ad is a book that's been inspired by Robinson Crusoe or is a retelling of it. Um, Charles W. Pollard concludes, teaching these contemporary works helps students see how Crusoe's world is still a place that they have lived in and come out of a place that remains useful because it helps them understand themselves by understanding their past. So I would say the same thing about this particular Robinson ad, the television show Crusoe. What does it tell us about the place we have both lived and come out of? A place that helps us understand ourselves by understanding our past. So I'm going to focus on the representation of Robinson Crusoe and Friday's relationship that really troubling element in the novel and that really troubling element in the Anglo-American past. So I'm going to start with the fact that in the novel, it's this really problematic relationship, at the very least. Um, that's a nice way of putting it's exploitative and racist. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a scene from Crusoe, and then I'm going to ask you to uh, share a little bit about what you notice. And this is me, the teacher, coming back. So, um, so watch and pay attention. Okay, okay. okay good. Okay, so Robinson is, he's, he's come down to the beach, because theoretically he's going to, yeah. Okay. He thinks these guys are going to rescue him. They do not look like they're going to rescue him.
hear of it? Well, I've got a dead one here. And we can't just leave it, can we? in here, right? I mean, it's like, it's fabulous. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, there's something that I noticed, and I noticed that in another film recently, the big Hollywood uh, ha gorgeous show, uh, that these natives have the most beautiful teeth. <laughs> and I just don't think that Nobody they have the opportunity for orthodontists, etc., to give them beautiful teeth. Yes, and in fact, there's going to be a pirate later on who I'm not going to show you, who has Stunning orthodonture. I mean, clearly, she's been like to some other place yeah. at some point in her adolescence before she came back and was a pirate. So yeah, I mean, they're they're quite beautiful in a 21st century sort of way. Yeah. Anything else you noticed about maybe Crusoe's relationship with other people or Friday's behavior? Anything like that? Admittedly, Friday's only on for a short bit. Crusoe does a whole lot of running and panting. 
for most of that clip. Yeah. He looks pretty clean for being out on an island by himself. Yeah. Right? And Crusoe's wearing this white shirt that's in awfully good shape for a guy who's been stuck yeah, yeah. for 20 years. Right? And you got to kind of wonder it's what's going on. Long. So there's some, there's some unrealism here, but Friday is very beautiful. He's very put together. Yep. He has a sense of humor. Yep. I was watching The Idiot Show. He has right. no facial hair. Um, no yeah. facial hair. Both of them very clean shaven for guys on an island. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um... So I'll, sh I'll show you some more of this, but what you're beginning to see, right, is, it, is that Crusoe, the television show, rewrites Defoe's relationship between Crusoe and Friday, um, and does it to specifically target racism, to attack racism, not just to claim a very different attitude for Defoe's protagonist, right, oh, Crusoe, he's not really racist, right, but also a very different past from our current moment. So I just want to pause for a moment here to say that when I talk about the guy on the television show, I'm going to call him Robinson, and when I talk about the guy in the novel, I'm going to call him Crusoe, because in the novel, he called himself Crusoe, and in the television show, everybody calls him Robinson. So if you ever, I don't know what would possess you to watch this show, you'll see he's called Robinson. So um, that's just to give you a sense of where we are. So um, yeah, and there's no way. Okay, so to begin with, let's make a note of the fact that Friday is in this adaptation. Um, Robert Mayer points out that in Castaway, did anybody see that with Tom Hanks? He's stuck mm -hmm. on the island, the oh, FedEx guy. Yeah. Right, yeah, there is no Friday, right? Friday gets converted into a volleyball. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it's an interesting conversion of a human being, right? And he's converted into a volleyball called Wilson because, of course, it's the corporate industrial, right? So he doesn't even have anything that looks, that's connecting him to something human, right? So, um, so this is really quite different. Not only that, <laughs> racism is put very specifically onto the villains. If you want to know a villain, you can tell by the way he, and it's always a he, talks about Friday in these horrific terms. <clears throat> Almost every episode, in fact, has Robinson reminding a stranger that Friday is not his servant, that they are equals, and that although Friday is indebted to him for his life, he is also indebted to Friday for his own. And there's a scene later on where one character says that, and by the way, people turn up on this island all the time. It's like Gilligan's Island. It's like, why can't you just get off the island? There are all these people here. So anyway, somebody arrives, and they say, what are you doing with this guy? And Crusoe says, I owe him my life. And they say, but Friday owes you his. And he goes, yes, but he gave me a reason to keep on living when I was ready to despair and die. Um, so Friday has also, in his way, saved Robinson. So Robinson and Friday also have a very ostentatiously equal relationship in this television show. Um, the relationship between Robinson and Friday is very determinedly fraternal. They are clearly keeping house together. There are frequent scenes of morning or evening domestic routines, washing, doing dishes. Um, episodes repeatedly open or close, and sometimes do both, with cooking and sharing food together, the two of them having dinner in their treehouse. Um, they call the treehouse home. Um, Friday and Robinson call each other brother. Um, they both, by the way, have very fraught relationships with their uh, either dead or absent father. So they sit. There's an episode where they sit on the beach and they talk about their dads. Um, so in episode eight, the name of the game, um, they discuss what they learned from their fathers. There's a um, the, ep the whole episode is built on what did your father teach you, um, and it's also pervaded by both men going back and ex exploring the anxiety that they have that they've disappointed their fathers in some ways. It's a very 21st century show. That, by the way, the real, the real Crusoe didn't have that sort of existential angst. He just thought, oh, it's too bad my parents died before I got home. Um, so the two men do share a rivalry. They don't have a rivalry in the novel, but they do in this. But it's a, it's a sibling rivalry. So Friday here acquires impeccable English. Um, he adds that to the roster of languages he already speaks. He speaks 12, including English. Um, he has developed a taste for Milton's sonnets, and he's memorized Paradise Lost. So, um, and I'll show you that scene in a moment. Robinson, on the other hand, can't even pronounce Friday's name. So I'm going to take you to that scene just for a moment, I hope. Here we go. Theoretically, I'm going to take you to that scene. Or not. Okay. They all look sulfily at each other in the jungle. Robinson, <laughs> of course, has his fetus. A set of necklaces he's acquired. Oh, come on, please. 
Then why do you curse in Spanish? Six years below Dexter. Okay. Good, yes. Do you need the line? No, we're good. Thank you, though. <laughs> Friday wants his arrow. Man's going, no, no, don't take the arrow out. No. And Friday says, I'm taking the arrow. <laughs> OK, here we go. Sandy could use the code. This gentleman, alas, needs a code no longer. Mm. What is he talking about? Friday needs this. Friday says that. He's making fun of me. He knows I can't pronounce his real name. You should beat him. Yeah, I'll try that. But why Friday? The day of the week I found him. I had this idea I was going to train him as a servant. Why well, he stuck with me, I don't know. You can't put your friend of a savage. That savage can make himself understood in 12 different languages. It took him six months to learn mine. I've read in Paradise Lost, and now he recites it back at me. So he can't read for himself, huh? No. Yeah. Savage. Lights, maestro. Thank you. Um, so, you see here then the, the pirate, the villain, clearly marked by his racism, right? You should beat him. Robinson going, yeah, yeah, right, I'll try that. Okay. Um, so there's really that, that inequality almost between Robinson and Friday in this episode, in this rendition that you don't see in others. Um, in addition, they have this current of competition, not just equality or inequality, but, but outright competition. Robinson consistently supplies the engineering and scientific knowledge and skill. Um, if, when you, if you see the treehouse or Robinson zooming through the forest on the zip line, he's built all of those. That's Robinson's, right? Um, okay, but in uh, the episode, The Name of the Game, Friday tries uh, constantly to come up with engineering feats as amazing as Robinson's. And of course, the whole comedy of that is that he's t he can't come up with it. Right. Okay, but on the other hand, uh, Friday repeatedly bests Robinson in feats of physical skill. And I don't mean like he's stronger, like he's just better with every kind of weapon you can imagine. He's constantly, he's the one who trains Robinson rather than the other way around. Um, the men roughhouse, they play games, as Robinson calls it in the episode Bad Blood. Um, they attack each other with weapons, and they fight to compete, but also to keep each other ready for attack by outsiders, which, as I've mentioned, happens all the time. Um, and yet they never get off the island. Um, so Crusoe then also deliberately rewrites very specific racially charged episodes in the novel. Um, and this is where, if you've read the novel and then you watch the show, it's fabulous, because you can pick up those little things, right? In the first episode, um, there's the Friday takes apart an umbrella, and an umbrella is like this thing that Crusoe spends 20 years trying to make on the island. And in the, in the television show, Friday takes it apart in like 32 seconds. And I'm sure that's a comment. So one of the very unfamous sections of Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe becomes enslaved. He's captured by the Moors, he's enslaved, um, and a fellow slave named Zuri helps him to escape. Um, they sail down the coast of Africa, and um, they're sort of picked up by a Portuguese captain who wants to buy Zuri from Crusoe, so Crusoe sells him Zuri. Um, kind of pro problematic, right? I mean, didn't Zuri just rescue him from slavery? Haven't they been sailing together as equals all this time? And then Crusoe's like, sure, I'll sell you Zuri. Okay. Um, the television series rewrites that, very specifically takes that episode. He cleanses Crusoe's uh, and Defoe's comfortable participation in slavery. Um, so in, the, in that scene, uh, in the television series, Crusoe Robinson is offered passage on a ship to England in exchange for Friday's freedom. You leave me Friday to be my slave, and I will take you wherever you want to go. Robinson, in the television show, absolutely refuses. Instead, what he does is he rescues Friday from the man who wants to buy Friday, and they jump off the ship, and they go back to the island. And they're not getting on this ship. So it's absolutely as opposite an episode as you can get. So as scholars, including the Pollard that I mentioned before, Georgie Haggerty, Roxanne Wheeler, Abby Johnson, there's been a lot written on this, Defoe's narrative is really deeply implicated, not just in imperialism and colonialism, but specifically in the slave trade and the racism that was developed to sustain and justify it. 
But the television show reconstructs the interaction between the races in the 17th century Americas. So the history that they show you is not the same one. They provide a fluidity of power dynamics, a respect, a mutuality that real history, or the history that we have based on documents, does not indicate. It's an ideal of the past, and it's an ideal of the present. This is who we were, therefore this is who we are, neither one of which bears a very close resemblance to the historical record. So, for example, think about it in 2008, uh, after Barack Obama was elected, everybody said, oh, we're post-race. Try that after Ferguson, right? So according to Crusoe, then, what you get is virtuous people yearn for and actively seek the brotherhood of men. The roots of this egalitarian attitude can be traced not only to the historical past, we used to be like this in the 17th century, but also the literary past in the form of Robinson Crusoe. See, if I'm telling you Robinson Crusoe, and this is the, this is the canonical literary past. This is what I used okay, to talk so about. Okay, so what's that mean? Uh, canonical. Canonical yeah. means the sort of thing that you'd be assigned to read in high school and college, oh. basically. Um, something that's people think that you have to have read it to be sort of a member of the culture. So Othello is canonical. Um, Robinson Crusoe would be considered canonical. Um, at this point, I would say Beloved is considered canonical. Books that you really, like, it's considered cultural literacy to have read, and you have to have read it. So that if later on you get through college and you're talking to Uncle Murray, and he says, you didn't read X, like, it's that kind of a reaction. Um, so, okay, I'm going to bring it in. Where am I going with this? Crusoe the television show retells Robinson Crusoe the novel. In its retelling, it rewrites the characters of and the relationship between Robinson Crusoe and Friday. It makes them emotionally close. It makes them equals. It makes them brothers. Why? Because doing so cleanses Defoe's novel of the racism and in the retelling offers a very different novel than the one that Defoe wrote. We imagine the novel to be different. We imagine our literary past to be different. And then, therefore, our historical past is different as well. Without a famous canonical, canonical endorsement of slavery, slavery exits the cultural and historical mainstream. So imbued with contemporary Anglo-American culture's ideal, ideal, mind you, not actual ideal racial attitude, um, those ideals themselves become mainstream. And they even come in possession of a historical literary pedigree. Right? Our ideal, we want to be this way, but look, we've always been this way. Right? And the bad people are the people who don't do what all of the good people do. The cultural artifacts that make us who we are are changed themselves by the way we create and present them. And therefore, the past that they represent, that changes as well. The stories that we tell make us who we are, but the stories that we retell not only make us who we are, they make us who we were. Thank you. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Karen, how about Huckleberry Finn? Mark Twain and the N word and um, all of that. Yeah. So I conduct that question by saying, "Oh, that's American literature. I don't do American literature." So I, you know. Um, so, but but I, I won't talk. Um, so what I'll say is, how come, So the American past is is deeply problematic for a lot of reasons. The British. Um, have, have a, actually, the British themselves have a historically different relationship with slavery than the Americans do. Um, slavery really didn't exist in, in uh, Great Britain itself. Um, they emancipated slaves much earlier. Lord Mansfield in 1774, which is where Jane Austen's Mansfield Park comes from, um, made a ruling about the fact that um, people of African descent owned themselves. Um, it became illegal to engage in the slave trade by 1811, according to the British. So their past is very different, and they can make certain claims about their past that are different that Americans really, we can't do, right? Um, Huckleberry Finn is, it's really a problematic text. I mean, even, even if we say, well, given the context in which it was written, or what's the context in which we read it, um, I... Don't envy anybody who wants to adapt that. I think it's hard enough just to teach it. Um, but I think the best thing we can do is to recognize what makes it problematic, what makes it troubling, and be, and be honest about that. Because there are things about it that are literarily brilliant, even though there are things that are ideologically extremely disturbing. Yeah. Phyllis, yeah? Okay. 
I'm talking about the um, Harper Lee's book, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. We've had, I've read the, um, the set of Watchmen. I love the book. But, and when people say, I don't want to ruin the image of a character. Right. And um, because in the book, the second book, it gives much more realism to, to the father, mm -hmm. to, Ad, to Atticus Finch. And the people, so if they make that movie, there will be people who will not want to see that adaptation. No. Which or has won't want to see it because it doesn't have Gregory Peck. What? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it won't have Gregory Peck, what's really important. And it will have a great deal of truth about where he was at that time, the right. place, and his feelings. It's yeah. No. Real. I think that, I mean, that's a perfect example, really, of what I'm saying, right? That we, we use something, we use a cultural artifact um, in a way that allows us to imagine certain things, imagine ourselves, imagine a past. And sometimes what we use them for is to recreate something the way we really wish it, it would be. Um, I'm working on a book right now, and, and um, one of the things I'm talking about is sort of the Disneyland phenomenon. <laughs> Right, which is that we create spaces to reflect our, our dreams or our fantasies rather than what they might actually have been like when we lived, when they were inhabited for real. Um, part of what you're saying is the problem of the sequel, right? Which is um, if you keep on telling the story, what came before it has to change, um, as opposed to adaptation, which is a retelling of that story. So it's a different mechanism, um, but but yeah, people. Don't I mean we? I have this problem with Austin all the time. I teach Austin because I'm a huge fan. But um, well, and she's a great novelist. But um, but my students will say, but that didn't happen in the Kira Knightley version, and now you know now the movie is ruined for me. And I'm like, well, the book? Maybe the book's pretty good, you know. So so it is that problem, right? That we're carrying those expectations. I just saw the movie Trumbo about Baldwin Trumbo, mm -hmm. and it was as realistic as you would think, because they showed excerpts of Ronald Reagan, and they showed the, the, the um, past. So, but like it made him seem like he was um, living very badly after he got out of jail, and that was another thing. And then I looked it up, and he had gone to Mexico City right <laughs> afterwards, while <laughs> living, you know, in the poor section of L.A. That, um, so even that, even though it was supposedly based on everything truthful, it, it omitted that Mexico City part. Yeah, it, it I mean, changed the whole dynamics for me, thinking, you know, how he sacrificed and sacrificed, but he wasn't living as badly as others at that time. <laughs> Couldn't afford to go. But right, but it would be a really different story, right, if we told it that way. The whole arc of character but development, the whole arc of narrative. If you see the movie, you'll see what I mean about it. It seems very you know, truthful. Most of it. Trumbo. Where's it playing? It special? was in Montclair for a while. It just slipped through. It went in and out of the theater. But you know, Phyllis, he sacrificed a lot of his career because of the ignorance uh, of the times. I mean, so he's living in Mexico City, but he his uh, his artistic life he was, was really My, squelched. And he also fought, you know, the Un-American uh, Committee. Mm -hmm. And which the only to. thing that was very interesting in that movie is that it ended in 1975. And we thought, you know, everyone else thought by 1960, the Spartacus, that it ended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in any case, that's the adaptation. Yeah, or, or, but also the, the, the sequel idea. Also. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're really now, kids read the book, and they see the movie, and they think that's the book. And they have that. As an interpretation, and they don't bother to read the book. So, you know, they end up believing that. And it's kind of like our political system, you know, a story gets told, exaggerated, exaggerated, person it's believed. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to. Right, you, you tell something often enough, it must be true. You know, um, yeah. So, so there is there is some of that. Um, in terms of adaptations, they actually go back a really long way. I mean, um, not the first adaptation, but sort of the first one that's really worth thinking about um, of Pride and Prejudice had Greer Garson and Laurence mm -hmm. Olivier, and they borrowed the costumes from Gone with the Wind because it was it saved them money. And I mean, if you want to talk about wrong clothing, <laughs> wow! And there's a scene where she's running down a hill, and I'm just waiting for her to flip over because she's got that huge skirt. Um, but you know, you got to think, gee, in 1939, if somebody is watching this, 
And then they go read the book, they're going to be like, what the heck? You know, so, I mean, she doesn't shoot any arrows? What? <laughs> you know, um, wow, and, and her sisters don't get drunk at the party and swing and throw up? I mean, how did that happen? Um, did they let that out in the novel? So, um, so I think in some ways that's always been a, a problem. Um, there have been some studies on whether seeing the um, film or the television generates more readers. Um, and the last data that I saw was that it didn't necessarily generate readers, per se, that people didn't necessarily rush out and read Pride and Prejudice, or if they did, they couldn't get through it because it didn't have a wet shirt scene, but, um, but that it generated kind of a sense of literariness um, that, that's uh, different and is its own interesting phenomenon. So I don't, I, I don't think the apocalypse is nigh in those terms. I, it's an election year, and the apocalypse is always nigh in an election year, but, uh, but not for reading purposes, I think. But it, but it, right, I mean, this is the problem with adaptations. It's always been a problem. But, you know, Shakespeare adapted, Chaucer adapted. I mean, they stole shamelessly from everywhere. I mean, how many Troilus and Crusaders had, can you think of offhand? Or Julius Caesar, so there's like a billion. Um, so... So it's it's always been it's always been with us, and happily, I don't think anybody would say you know you really shouldn't read that Shakespeare, or, you know Julius Caesar. It's it's not the way it really happened. So and, um, so there are some merits to it too. I'm sorry, I just thought about West Side Story. Yeah, mm -hmm. thinking about that Romeo and Juliet. Absolutely, Pygmalion. Yeah. Mm. Yes. We, I mean, we could, there's, a, there's a million of them, right? We could name them. We don't even think about lady. them as adaptations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which would you your favorite? Oh, uh, hold on. I'm sorry. There's a question over here. You raised an interesting point in talking about the adaptations from earlier in the century in that they try to rewrite history to who we were. In the Harry Potter adaptations, yeah. for me, what was awful was they took the house elves and what J.K. Rowling was saying about slavery and about otherness, and they trivialized it, and they actually destroyed the point for me. And I'm starting to wonder if that's common now in the adaptations that occur now, as opposed to the ones that are written about earlier novels. I think that's probably, that's a phenomenon that you can find kind of any time and anywhere, that somebody will retell that story because they're comfortable or uncomfortable with certain elements because it serves their purposes or it doesn't. So, for example, this whole idea about the Crusoe-Friday relationship, these are best buds on an island, you know, um, making smoothies and it, composting, which they do, by the way, um, you know, it's a, it, that is not Robinson Crusoe from 1719, and it suits somebody's purpose to recreate that. Um, it certainly suited the movie maker's purpose to take out that whole wonderful analysis of economic exploitation and labor and slavery. Absolutely. And, and I agree with you that when you take something out like that, really suspect. It's, I mean, what, what's being promoted? But, you know, it's movies are made by corporations, and what do corporations need, and what do they benefit from? And so, you know, there's, you, you can go back. Adaptations have pretty much always done that. I mean, the same thing with that uh, Pride and Prejudice that I was referring to. In that Pride and Prejudice, the whole class conflict basically gets erased at the end. Um, that Lady Catherine shows up and she harasses Elizabeth, and Elizabeth, you know, gives her the line, "Gentleman's daughter, blah de blah." And Lady Catherine walks out of the house and says to Darcy, "You're absolutely right. You should get married. She's perfect for you." Poof! There goes the whole class issue, which was, you know, fairly fundamental to the novel and all the other ones. So, um, so we, we all, I think there are ways in which that can always happen. There's a Gulliver's Travels from 1939, I think it's 39, 39. Uh, it came out I think the same year as Steamboat Willie, and um, it's by the Fleischer Brothers. And in it, Gulliver is this really benevolent, lovely guy, and there's a Romeo and Juliet story happening in Lilliput, and he helps the lovers get together, and he ends the war that would keep them apart, and it's like, what? Where did that come from? But it's 1939, right? We are on the brink of World War II. It can't be a coincidence that Gulliver's Travels, which is, a, which is about two nations at war, implacably at war, gets reconciled by the representative of England coming in and making them stop hating each other, right? It's just, I can't believe that that could be an accident. Which is your favorite accident? I don't. I don't have one actually. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I like one better or worse depending on how my students respond. <laughs> um, so, so for example, I I love the adaptation of Emma. That's clueless. I think it's it's fabulous. Um, and my students are stunned. 
And so I really don't know anymore whether one of the reasons why I love it so much is because I love the look on their faces when they come into class after they've seen it. They're like, oh my god, I had no idea that was Emma. I mean, it's kind of fun, you know. Um, so so they're sometimes, you know, so there's, there's that to it. Um, comes and goes. You know, I think my daughter's pin, Don't Judge a Book by Its Movie, really stands for me. I'm, I'm a book person, you know. I mean, that's sort of my stock and trade, so... It's it's hard to know, but there but there are adaptations that I think are very clever, like the adaptation of Tristram Shandy, for example. I think is extremely clever. I don't like it, but I admire its perspective on it. Um, I love the two Emmas that were made in ninety five ninety six with uh, Kate Beckinsale and Gwyneth Paltrow back to back, uh, because together they make a fascinating text on the on on the role of Emma, and that gets back to it, the question earlier about sort of what gets erased. Um, one Emma is all about it as a as a funny love story, and one Emma is all about it as, as all about class exploitation. And it's the same book, so I love having those together. So I, um, <laughs> yeah. The, the most recent Far From the Madding Crowd with Carrie Mulligan is really good. Have you seen that? That one I haven't oh, seen. Oh, I I yeah. absolutely love that book. It's one of the best movies I've seen recently, and I to to the best of my recollection, very faithful. Um, I don't know it. I have to say, Hardy, it's, um, we 18th century people, you know, you get to those guys with the big open frilly shirts and we kind of tune out. So um, so anybody after them, not so much. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, um, the adaptations of, Harvey, of Hardy, I've heard, actually, are, are quite good. Um, Thackeray comes and goes, right, you know, he's kind of like the Vanity Fair they made about 20 years ago, was, you know, it, was, it had its problems. There was a really good, oh, I can't remember it now, George Ellett, Middle March in the 90s that was extremely good. Um, so they've done some really interesting things. You know, when the British get hold of a Dickens, they usually do a really good job, too, but they do it, like, over 50 days, So, <laughs> which, which Americans, we don't tend to do that so much. Yeah. You are terrific. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Tell us the ending of the story. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. So 13 episodes <laughs> later, um, 13 episodes later, it turns out that Crusoe is the legitimate heir of a fortune that the guy who arranged for him to get stranded on the island has been trying to steal, and his children back in England have been locked up in a sweatshop run mysteriously by priests. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, but then the woman who is dressed as a doctor who he found on the island goes back and finds his wife who's been locked in a madhouse. You see where I'm going with this whole idea. And then they go and they basically attack the priests and rescue the children and gallop off. And Crusoe, in the meantime, is still on the island. And then the series ends. And it's like, really? Yeah. Every Friday or happy. You know, we're having a happy ending. Thank you all for coming.